Greetings! In this month's episode of the CT Teach podcast, we discuss career technical education in the video game industry with our panel of CTE educators and industry professionals. So sit down, buckle up, and get ready for this month's episode of the CTE Teach podcast starting now. Greetings, this is the CT Teach Podcast. My name is Christopher McClung, your podcast moderator. And this month we are discussing career technical education in the arts, media, and entertainment industry, primarily the video game industry. And I have with me five superstar power-up panelists, and I will go ahead and let them introduce themselves. And go ahead, guys, and please introduce yourselves, who you are, and what you do. Well, hello, I'm Alexander O'Brien. I am a teacher with Green Valley High School through CryRop down in Ukaipa. I'm teaching animation and video game design. With my background, it comes from 3D character uh, animation. So uh, doing all the bringing to life all those characters that you move around. And yeah, that's, that's basically what I do. And I love enjoying uh, getting other people who are passionate about it as well involved, um, watching them grow and, and figure out how things uh, work. And yeah. My name is Christian Bonilla. I teach uh, animation and game design as well at Citrus Valley High School in Redlands, California. I'm Chris DeLeon. I teach primarily on the internet. I've got my own company called HomeTeamGameDev.com. It's uh, people around the world build games for practice. It's freeware. When they get stuck, me and my trainers help them. And we've got podcasts and video courses and stuff all kind of connected to that or YouTube videos and that sort of thing. Outside of there, I help out with Indiecade, a international arts festival. Uh, currently, our alumni lead used to be our speaker organizer as well as on our IGDA local chapter in Los Angeles. I'm our chair for our board. And then earlier in life, I was a technical game designer in Electronic Arts, uh, producer for some indie games that did well a dozen years ago, and uh, early hire with a company that became PopCap San Francisco, though I was with it before it became that. Um, yeah. My name is Timothy Hill. I am a veteran game designer. I've been doing it for a bit over 10 years now. Um, I also have taught in the past. I, I taught animation and game design as well, and I'm currently an adjunct, adjunct instructor at my old college. So I am a game designer and teacher. Fantastic. And so for our final panelist, I wanted to introduce you to, he's the founding father of competitive gaming, the man who originated tracking world record high scores in video games, including his work with Guinness World Records. Um, you, may have, you may have viewed him in such documentaries as Chasing Ghosts, Man vs. Snake, and The King of Kong. And he was an inspiration for Mr. Litwack in the film Wreck-It Ralph and an inspiration to author Ernest Cline for his best-selling novel, which turned into a film called Ready Player One. So everyone, this is Walter Day. Walt, want to go ahead and say hi to everybody? I'm honored to be here. Hello, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Well, first, I wanted to say thank you for listening. Uh, the podcast is, this podcast is created in partnership with the California Department of Education, and the purpose of this podcast is to just bring forth discussions and relevant topics concerning career technical education. But before we start, I want to ask a very personal, highly touchy um, question, which is, if you were trapped on a deserted island by Thanos for five years, and you, which basically means there, at one point there was two of you, but now there's just one of you for five years, um, and you only had access to one game, what would that game be? Well, you know, I, I thought about this one because there's a lot of different wonderful, great games that you could play again and again and again. And I, I have to go back to Ratchet and Clank. Um, that game has so much great grinding. It has a variety of gameplay. It's funny. It has a great progression. Uh, you can play it again and again and again and just continue to pull over uh, your progress through each playthrough. Uh, it's just so much fun. Um, yeah, Ratchet and Clank all the way. Nice. Yeah, for me, uh, if I was trapped on an island, I'd probably have to say going with Minecraft. I think that's just such a timeless game, and uh, there's just so much you can do in it. 
And gosh, it's been so long since I've actually sat down and played it. Uh, they've added so much new stuff since I played originally about 10 years ago, back when the game was in alpha. Wow. So yeah. Uh, so for me, it's going to be Bubble Bobble by Taito, which is both, uh, I've got my NES cart with me here. It's why the arcade cabinet behind me is mostly for that. Uh, and, you know, I'm tempted to, I could go for some like more difficult game like Gravatar where I can just like keep practicing and drill, drilling. But I like how relaxed Bubble Bobble can be that I can play it for high scores. I can also just play it just to chill out. Uh, it's something which I've been playing since I was a young child. Every chance I get, I just bought it again on Switch. I don't need it again. But I just, they deserve more of my money for the benefits they've given me throughout my life. I have got it on PS4. I don't need it on PS4. Every chance they do to let me spend money on Bubble Bobble, I'm sending it to Taito. <laughs> nice. Um, I thought about this long and hard too, because there's so many good options, you know, throughout the world, you know, the video game world, but I'm actually going to go a little bit sideways here. I would pick the game of chess. You didn't say video game specifically, you said game. Okay. I would pick the game of chess because I am, I love chess to death. It's one of my favorite games. I think it's the purest form of strategy and I'm horrible at it, even though I love to play it. So I would love to take those five years and become a chess master. Nice. What about you, Walt? Well, first of all, I like your answer about chess, and I completely agree with you. The, the fundamental principles that are in operation in the game of chess are distributed throughout every single game. Every single game will have chess kind of uh, maneuvers and situations. It's just that they're all covered up with the graphics and a lot of other stuff that, that just covers up the essential nature of strategy, tactics, you know, stuff like that. So I, I agree with that. Chess is the purest embodiment of actual strategy. So, but I think, I think, I think Thanos, did I say his name right, Thanos? Yeah. Or is it, it's not Tahanos, so he's not Greek, right? Tahanos. No. Okay, so he's Thanos, Thanos. So I think his ego's so big that I wouldn't let him get away with that. What I do is I'd say, look, so you wanna, you wanna make this happen. So I'd say, okay, best of 5,000 games. You can have to stay there with me for the next 15, 20 years. We go head to head again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And to make it a, a real uh, island championship, it can't be just one game. We'd have to play like between three and five games. And so, uh, and I would, uh, just like uh, most military maneuvers, you try and take the high ground, you try and position your troops on, uh, on terrain that's, favorable to you and that you already know. One of the reasons General Sherman was so good in his march across Georgia was because in 1842, he had been situated, he had been stationed there by the US government to go after stolen saddles. So he knew all the back roads of Georgia. So it made it easier for him to maneuver around the other troops, you know, the Confederate troops in Georgia. So that's, that's my angle on how I'd approach Thanos as, uh, trying to put me on an island to play one game. So I'd make him have to go and do it with me, whether he likes it or not. So that, that's my ruling on that. And what would the games be? Well, the games would be a centipede. You know, all old school, you know? Yeah. I told Chris and the students yesterday, quite often when a person gets older, they end up liking the most the games that they grew up with and started with. Because that gets indelibly marked, like written in stone inside their nervous system. Even though other games would be more enchanting, and very interesting, more provocative in some ways, the ones that will be dearest to their hearts are the ones that win their hearts first. So Centipede, uh, not Pac-Man, that would bore me to death. <laughs> but actually, if I took Pac-Man, Thanos would give up and say, okay, just so I don't have to play Pac-Man with anymore, Thanos would let me off and leave the island. Okay, but it's so boring. Um, and uh, sorry it takes so long. I know when you got 30 minutes, but, but mainly Centipede, a game called Make Tracks, and I liked Wizard of War a lot. So those are all like 1981, 82 games. So that's my long-winded answer. No, that's a great answer. And that just goes to show why you are who you are, because that's just a great way of looking at, at that specific question. So now I kind of want to transition. Uh, we, so all of us in here, basically, we're here because we have an appreciation for students, we want to help encourage students and, and get them along into fulfilling whatever it is their dreams are in, in whether it be in the game industry or, or some other form of, of um, career path. But what I wanted to ask, and again, this is mostly 
if you are a student listening to this at home, want to kind of ask you guys, how did you each obtain a career in the video game industry um, and to become a, just a, an industry professional or even somebody who's allowed, no, I shouldn't say allowed, somebody who's given the opportunity to teach um, video game design in a high school? Like, how did you guys go from loving video games to now it's part of your profession? And, I'll, and again, this... We don't have, a, have to have a specific order for this. You guys can feel free to just jump in and and what is your answer to that? Um, well, I oh, good Alex. Yep. Um, I had always just loved games and movies and anything that was fictional and fantastical. So when I went back to school and um, began to say, okay, I wanted to study something, uh, it was all about animation and visual effects and learning how to bring something to life and breathe that uh, life in there and make it move and make uh, just, just you know, that, that joy that you see when something starts moving on its own or it starts speaking on its own. And you've done that. Uh, it, I don't know, it's a uh, God complex might be the wrong thing, but it, it does create that sort of feeling like, ah, I, I did that. And um, so being able to do that and then have other people share in that and experience that, whether it's through just watching or making them uh, a part of it through the interactive um, action of video games so that they can play something and experiencing it. Um, every, every game that I make and play with my, my students, um, my students always call me a troll because I make the most complex and ridiculous puzzles. And uh, I'm just there to make them you know, like love and hate the experience at the exact same time, right? So uh, that, that was what kind of compelled me to get into creating and then being able to share that with others and teach them how to go in and in turn do it uh, for themselves and for uh, the enjoyment of watching other people play with your creation as well. That's what, that's what gets me going. Well, my road was a little bit different, um, a little bit longer, I should say. Uh, I always knew I wanted to be a video game designer. Like even when I was five years old, I was, you know, always drawing characters and maps and power-ups and anything you could possibly think of, you know? So I've been doing it literally since I was five years old. Uh, fast forward a little bit, um, college comes, ha comes time to go to college and I didn't know what to, I wanted to do. I just thought I wanted to do something in video games. So I thought, oh, I wanted to be a writer for video games. So I started studying writing. And at the same time, I also got a degree in business administration. And then just by happen chance, I took a right turn and went with the business degree instead of the writing degree. Did that for a few, a few years, realized I hated it, went back to school to study video game uh, design and animation, uh, graduated with another degree, and then uh, immediately went to work. My first job was in, um, it's a QA tester in, uh, at Blue Fang Games. And then, yeah, from ever since then, I've been working in the industry. I took a few years off to teach, and now I'm doing both at the same time. I suppose I can go ahead. Uh, I also want to real quick jump in on the point of, I loved Walter's earlier point of the idea of making Thanos play with you. Because one of my problems with Bubble Bobble is it's fundamentally really good in co-op. And I was like, well, I don't want to put him alone all the time. No, he's my player too. And we got to play together. Yeah. Love it. Um, yeah, so for my career uh, stuff going into it, I I grew up, uh, basically where it started for me was mod scene stuff. And really, and I hate saying this, but you know, I was a child. Uh, I read some stuff about how I could cheat at Command and Conquer. And I was very interested. And, the, and it was just for single player. I was not talking about this way, you know, no tournaments or anything. I'm not cheating other players. But I could like tweak the numbers to make units cheaper to buy or make their weapons more powerful. And very quickly, I realized how unfun that made the game when I did that to myself. And I had this interesting design challenge of, okay, well, the numbers shouldn't be maxed or minned. Why are they any different? And so I started doing some level design there. And then same things for Doom, same things for Descent. And I very quickly hit the wall of, I don't want to keep rearranging somebody else's stuff. I want my things to twiddle with the numbers with and be able to add a whole new part and then rip out a whole thing. And, and that's what kind of led me down the path to making games as uh, I was a hobbyist for eight years before I did any of it professionally. And still that's been very close to my heart. No matter what else my career has taken me to do, including when I've had day jobs in industry or otherwise, I was still making my own stuff on the side. I'm a, to me, it's one of these things where like a person who is a dancer is going to find a way to dance. A singer is going to find somewhere in their life to sing. A writer is going to find somewhere to tell stories whether or not some years it's their day job, some years it's connected to it, and some years they're teaching it, some years, whatever the relationship is to it, I'm still doing it. And so for that to me, a lot of the work I've done as an educator too on the internet is basically at a lower level of, hey, uh, separate from, do you want to sell tickets to see your show? Do you want to learn how to play a guitar? That version for video games of like, this is a skill you can have, you can practice, you can do it. May or may not find you have the knack for it, you want to turn to a job. But a lot of people I work with, there really are that kind of level where he's like karate class things. If not everyone doing that expects to be a stunt actor, it's just because 
here's a skill that's cool to have and enriching to have and develops myself through it. And so that's always been kind of my angle into it. And where that turned into career for me was even when I went to undergrad, I still had no intention of doing games specifically. I was just like, well, I can program. Companies need programming, so I got a CS degree. I, I started a college club that made games that was doing fairly well, and we had a chance to pull in a guest speaker. That guest speaker was an EA recruiter. That's how they found out about me and my resume, and that's what led to me getting my foot into that door. Uh, and that's one of those things where, frankly, those letters on the resume were probably at least as useful than my college letters on the resume of opening up a few other options after that as an early career move into technical game design stuff. But very quickly, I figured out that I really liked and missed my small team stuff. I liked being on teams of three or five or 10 where I knew exactly the part Jessica's doing and what Tim's doing. And I felt very alienated at the enormous 300 person team of like, I don't know what the entire fourth floor is up to, or we got meetings on meetings on meetings and I respect the work that comes out of it, but it just wasn't where I was happy. And so I found my way back to smaller teams as being kind of my way of doing it still. I'll jump in next here. Uh, I don't have as much experience as maybe some of the other people on this podcast, but you know, ever since I was younger, I always knew that I like to create things. Um, I remember like very early on, I was really into games that had the ability to let you edit levels. <clears throat> so games like Tony Hawk Pro Skater, you know, you could build your own parks, uh, Halo added in Forge, and then of course, everyone knows like Minecraft, those types of games, sandbox games. Uh, so I always knew I wanted to create. It wasn't until I got out of high school that I kind of realized that I actually wanted to, to teach more than anything. Um, and so luckily, you know, doing what I do now, I'm able to combine those two things. But yeah, I'd taken, you know, some colleges, I'm sorry, some classes in, in uh, high school and college on game design. And after that, I got a little bit of experience in the entertainment industry. And, you know, the opportunity came up to teach um, game design and animation, and I knew I had to jump on it. Well, all right. So, so these are great answers. You guys are you guys got a lot of firepower. And after all the years I've dealt with people, it's interesting. You can see, you can see the people who have higher, have firepower and other people don't have as much firepower. So you guys are definitely, definitely going to cook up some interesting things for the world before you're through with all this stuff. But to me, the most important thing always is leading younger people through your own example and inspiring them, hopefully through your own example or at least bringing other people as an example up to inspire them. So I can see that you folks are all in that same kind of like flow. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, my background is almost inexplicable because in some ways I can't figure out how I got here either. So uh, right now I'm sort of retired from a lot of stuff, but I still do make appearances as uh, the guy who started Twin Galaxies and stuff like that, Mr. Litwack. That one of the most rewarding things is have little kids with wide eyes come up and want my autograph as Mr. Litwack. That is fun, okay? That is definitely something I was never seeing because what you'll find out is that each step of the way, each step does not tell you where the path is really going and each step does not tell you where you're going to end up. So just what you got to do is just do the best and most creative, and most honorable thing you can do each step of the way and that, not only will that inspire you to go on and be more assertive and knowing you're right to go on in the direction you're going, but it also inspires and helps other people. So it's very cool. So no, who would have guessed that I'd be in a Disney thing someday and I'd be Mr. Lowack and I'd be signing autographs for little kids as a Disney character. It's pretty, pretty surreal, surreal. Is that I say that right? Surreal. <laughs> and uh, I'm still trying to master English. My high score on Centipede is much higher than my SAT on English. Okay. Anyway, uh, so I was the scorekeeper, as the organizer of contests, as doing lots of things that may eventually, someday they're going to decide if there's a father of esports. I know I'll be on that list of candidates, but of course it's not for me to decide who's the father of esports because it's something that'll be done but through a common consensus of probably a lot of people and probably a few years from now. Probably won't happen for a while. Right now, all the different dynamic groups that are fighting to want to be the fathers of esports, they're going to fight about it for a long time before the finally everybody gives up and, and starts reviewing the history and maybe I'll be on that list of candidates. But, but anyway, I did a lot of stuff. It was a lot of fun. And the reason it was so much fun is because I absolutely loved video games. I loved video games so much that I opened up an arcade as an excuse to be able to play video games for the kids till two in the morning. And I did that for years and I probably was the best video game player in the world at the age of 32. There's other 32-year-olders, you know, 
they have not really been, not too many of them have been in an arcade yet. But I don't know how much to say because I could talk a lot. So why don't we pass the baton back to Chris, okay? Well, and, th and thank you. That's, that's a great answer. And I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. So, so with that, while maybe you can be the one to, to start this conversation and we can all collaborate on this next question together, which is, um, in your guys' opinion, how do you think the video game industry has, e has evolved over the years? And what do you think some of the key elements have been in its evolution from maybe from the arc arcade games of the 70s and 80s to now we're in 2020, there's a lot more virtual reality gaming going on. And just what are some of the milestones that you think of have occurred over the years? Do you want me to start? Sure, yeah. Okay, so anyway, the evolution of the gaming industry, uh, there, there's, 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 different, there's different powers that are involved in it. First of all, there's the business side, there's the public playing the games, and there's people creating the games, and there's, there's more sides too. But anyway, in the past, um, a lot of hiccups happened for the video game industry because many of the people who were involved in it were primarily driven as uh, entrepreneurs or business people. So for instance, the nice famous 1983-84 crash, that happened because uh, lots and lots of people were involved in it who were seeing it, of course, as a business, just like having a chain of laundromats or something, having a chain of arcades or something like that. So everything was highly leveraged. It was all, all a business thing. The business the failure of the business plan that most people are using, because remember when you buy an arcade game back in the old days, as I said yesterday, it's the equivalent because of the high level of cost, it was the equivalent to buying a car. So when you had an arcade, you had a room full of, uh, of mortgaged automobiles there on your floor inside your arcade. Eventually everything crashed and the, game, and the arcade started making less money. Everybody got their games repossessed. And that's what happened to my Twin Galaxies years ago in March of 84. A truck pulled up by surprise one day and repossessed all the games that were put in there by another company, a third party, that was leasing them to us as a vending uh, route operator, as they called them. So it's interesting how I see one of the big obstacles to the development and the evolution of the gaming thing is how everybody's business plan is going to work out. Because the business plans usually pay for everybody doing more and more research, more and more development, more and more creative implementation and adaptation, all sorts of stuff like that. So it's one of the best things that's happening is the evolution of the business plan is getting more robust. And I hate that word, by the way. There's a period when everybody used that word every other sentence, okay? So it's becoming more powerful so that more and more people are putting more and more money into the business plan. So even just like a lot of big businesses that are on the stock exchange, even when it's losing hundreds of millions every year, it still has so much investment money flowing through it that they can keep, play, keep going on and keep paying people. So the business plans are getting better and stronger, which means it's fortifying the process of creativity, which is good. And inside the, inside the field of creativity, there are more people now who are more well-trained, who are more inspired. It's sort of like sports, in other words, the baseball players today and the football players, they start training on a serious level much younger, high school, junior high school. So by the time they reach the NFL or MLB, I mean, I mean, there's, I mean, I grew up in the era when Mickey Mantle was one of my heroes. You know, I think you remember who he was, but look at how big and strong these guys are. Like Mickey Mantle, by the time he retires, says, look, I can't hit off these pitchers anymore. I used to bat off guys when they were five foot seven and they were round. And now these guys are like Don Drysdale was six foot six and he was so powerful that he once pitched like 81 innings without a hit or something like that. The point I'm getting at is that in the same way, same parallel to the way sports has grown, training has grown, opportunity is more available, the skill set is more, uh, what word am I looking for? It's just buried inside people's psyche. It's like the DNA of the people. The DNA is like uh, of the young students. It's, it's just like a more depth, smarter DNA or something so that we're going to come up with better designers who are making better designs. We're going to be able to understand how to use the equipment better. So anyway, the creative side of the uh, equation is going to be far more dramatic and it's probably going to increase in this drama exponentially. So, uh, and the opportunity, that might be the best thing because even people who aren't that good at anything, they have all that equipment, whether they're doing music in their basement and it sounds like it was made in an expensive studio that would have paid $300,000 just 15 years earlier to do the same level of, you know, uh, equality. Just opportunity, creativity, manpower, business plan. Does this make sense to you guys? 
It's all coming together on a level that there's never been available before. And so it's going to be so remarkable that all I know is that all these science fiction movies, they're not that far off the point that a lot of interesting stuff's going to come. And it's going to be driven more by the, by the advent of the modern video game era than probably any other science, it seems. Two things seems to drive science forward. Video game development and the coronavirus plague. <laughs> That's sort of a joke, but unfortunately there's a little bit of truth in that. When something like the plague happens, then everybody starts really getting into the science and figuring out new things. And when there's that much money to be made by a great new game, it causes just the technology to develop and just everything to develop. So, uh, and it used to be NASA decades ago, as I was saying yesterday, that was driving most of the scientific developments. Now it's the gaming industry and also medical worries. So that's my statement. Yeah, if I, if I can run that, because I think there's a thing related to that, and, and very much so, I mean, I hear everything, you have like, I remember when graphics cards were new to install on my computer and video games were the reason why we had our 3DFX voodoos and all those kind of early things, monster graphics cards. And now, of course, they're not just Bitcoin, they're used for all kinds of like noise reduction technology and all kinds of video processing in parallel. And games are driving that stuff and why so many people have the headsets for VR, businesses, other people looking for ways to use that now while they can't go outside anyway. But to that point about the, the, the I love the thing of like 15 years ago, it cost $300,000 of equipment to be able to make music like someone can do now on their laptop out of the box. Um, this has been an enormous factor from a lot of indies on the small side of business who are kind of scrappy, don't necessarily have a business background, get fearful about like, oh, there's 30, there's like 30 plus games coming out to Steam a day. There's literally hundreds of new mobile games a day. And I think what they're missing from that is what it really reflects is that you no longer have to have access to a million dollar Silicon Graphics workstation to be able to make a, any, an SNES game um, mm -hmm. like Rare used to have access to. You no longer have to be the only person in the world who's like brilliant enough at the curve of writing optimization to be able to get a FPS game to work on a 386. Everybody can do this now. And so for better and for worse, we're starting to have more and more of the kind of problems in games creation space that frankly, every creative field has always worked with. You can play piano, congratulations, so can a lot of people. You can write a story, congratulations, so can a lot of people. What are you gonna do to set yourself apart and do something really interesting with it? Form a relationship to your customers. How are you gonna build your reach in a way that obviously again too, like it no longer comes down to, do you know the right person to be able to get your stuff through to get your face on a billboard? We have the opportunity now to actually build our own connections to people, to build our own brands, email lists, presences on Twitter, on YouTube, uh, podcasts, et cetera. Uh, and that's just all I think have been a very, good thing for all the struggles of it it becomes less about it still helps to know the right people for a million reasons but it's less about well then you're gated off you're blacklisted from the 12 people who we have to talk to or the one connection you have to find to get to listen to you and a little more than it used to be to be able to just do a thing and find a way to build out from there mm -hmm. very cool good points yeah to kind of bounce off that a little bit uh games both development of and the way they're played nowadays are much more social. I mean, games in general have always been a social medium, but you know, there's also the image of you know, the lone gamer too. But I mean, anything, anything from esports to you know, playing Minecraft or Fortnite online or whatever you know, whatever the new you know flavor of the month might be. Like these games are getting more and more social in terms of gameplay, right? Um, but it also helps to have a social network to become a developer for these games, right? You know, they always say it's who you know, not what you know, in the industry. So uh, you know, being able to develop these relationships with other developers is always a good thing for you know, the future of our industry. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. So, and then, so from what I'm hearing is you, is you guys were saying that, you know, the technology is by far more accessible. Do you think the involvement has occurred because technology has occurred or the involvement has also occurred because people's creativity has got expanded? And what I'm thinking of is, you know, Walt, back when, when, and I remember playing in the arcades and playing, you know, Pac-Man and Ninja Turtles or whatnot, there wasn't a whole lot of storytelling that went into those. It was just plop your quarter in, stay alive as long as you can. Um, and then now we have people who can spend 20 to 30 hours inside a video game world, conquering quests, meeting people, talking to um, NPCs. And then what do you think has contributed to that? If I can wait, this is actually pretty close to my grad school research was on okay. uh, some of the stuff had to do with like basically, obviously people's payment models affect the types of games we design. And this is the same sort of thing people got their feathers ruffled over about in-app purchases games or games sold by advertising. Those are trying to optimize to keep you coming back to it. 
And same thing for an arcade, for that use case of you're putting a quarter in it. You can't have a long ramp up time. You can't have a digestible experience of I've played it all, now I'm done, put it on the shelf and gather dust. It needs to start immediately, lose when I'm done, and give me a reason to get a quarter in there and be right back in the action again. And I think part of the thing that actually toppled the, the change towards the longer story-based games in addition to system storage. I mean, an NES game could have an actual arc to it. Atari, it was already a stretch for Warren Robinett to fit Atari on an Atari cartridge famously had to use like something like C pointers on hardware that was not built for that to be able to make that even possible at all. But like for uh, the rental market, I think is actually where we saw some of those longer things come out where suddenly if I could get the full game experience by renting it for two days, I'm never going to spend $60 on this. As soon as you give me a week of content, and I'm looking at, do I want to pay long-term fees? Do I want to get to rent it three or four times? Now I'll buy it because I know many weeks of entertainment out of this. And suddenly the market is discouraging or penalizing a short one-time pop it, play a puzzle game, kind of milked it for all it's worth, nothing new to see there, done. And if I want to see the last stages of Zelda 2 and Castlevania and Contra, I'm going to need some time to throw at it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I remember yesterday, Walt, when you were talking with our students, you, you talked about how there were, you've come across players who what was amazing about them was they could live for so long on a quarter and there would be crowds around that person because they would just keep going and going and going and going on this one quarter. And so I think, I think that's cool. What in 1999, I did the, I did the official uh, world championship on Hydra Thunder that was put up by Midway Games and getting ready for that contest. Do, do you guys know Hydra Thunder? You know, you sit in like a, out and you're riding this. The arcade one is so cool. Uh, the home version was pretty cool too, but the arcade one was special. So I had to deal with that game quite a lot, building up to the summer and then fall contest in 1990 of, of, of Hydro Thunder. And so uh, we had a preliminary scoreboard listing all the highest scores, and the highest scores were the designers of the game. Okay, they had very high scores. And then as soon as the game really went mainstream and it was out there in lots of arcades, and the players in the arcade started getting their hands on it, suddenly the designers started shaking their heads saying, we don't know how these people are getting these high scores like this, because the gamers had it in their DNA to just the master of the game far more than the people who actually created the game. That's always been an interesting uh, example of the phenomena of ex expertise in gameplay. There's something in the DNA, and there's nothing like a superstar game player, way beyond the skill set and the brilliant comprehension that you'd expect or find in the actual game designers who created the game. Interesting, huh? Yeah, that's very interesting. And so kind of since we're on the topic of just how games have evolved, um, my teachers in here, you guys are pretty much at the ground level of seeing what our students are now creating. Can you talk to maybe what are some of the what are some of the things that the students are into? What are what are the things that they are creating? Are they essentially trying to mimic stuff? Are they doing new stuff, like creating Guitar Hero using a keyboard? I mean, how, what have you seen? So one thing I've seen, um, this is only my first year teaching, but I remember from my experiences in the classroom, how things differ now, is the students come in with a lot more experience uh, right off the bat. So if they're interested in the subject, I mean, I have a student who came in already knowing the program that we use, like front to back, basically. Uh, so sometimes they even, you know, I think you can speak to this experience where the students teach you a lot more than you teach them. Uh, and that's how it is. So yeah, I am seeing them come in a lot more like than I remember when I was in school with just more, more experience. Um, one of the things that they're really into, uh, like most students would be, would be, of course, VR, right? So they want to make VR experiences. They want to dive deeper into that and explore that medium. There's a few different groups that I work with and on the at the high school level. So I, I'm at the advisory board out here for Hawkins uh, CDAGS program. And uh, among their students at a high school level, they've got like a four year thing weaving together some different curriculum. I've been really impressed to see the extent to which their, their focus is things that are like games with a message, games that are telling a story, games that are conveying something, games that aren't just, and I, I grew up playing plenty of games for entertainment sake and everything wrong with any of that. But it used to be this kind of obscure niche on the internet where like professors like Warren Bogo or Ian Bogos would write about like, this game is saying something rhetorically. And here at a student level, at high school, beginner level, they're finding ways to tie it to history, to tie it to American culture, to tie it to questions in their lives that they're dealing with in their situations. And I really love seeing that. Um, out of the other groups, out of the NDK, the arts festival people, we do see a lot of, like you said, exp extremely experimental. There's a good group out in Copenhagen that does 
They literally made like playing violins with a mouse on a broomstick and stuff. Just really bananas off the wall stuff because they're trying to stand out. They know that the way they do that is going to do something no one's seen before. And then on the sort of third group I work with, my home team group, we really kind of there, because they're working on a longer arc, we think about our fundamentals and we actually specifically there start them on the remaking classic clones because basically one of the things we're trying to start them on is the fundamentals of like, if I, want, if I have a long-term plan to be a chef or a mathematician, I'm starting off with kind of known problems to get used to the technique, to get used to the big picture, get used to the tools, separate from, okay, now that I have these things in my tool belt, when, how am I going to apply and remix and do interesting things building off of that? Uh, and it's just, there's all kinds of different approaches and there's different fits for different folks and what they want out of it. Well, um, I, I see a lot of, I, to kind of reiterate what they've said, um, a, a lot of the students want to create something that's meaningful. Um, they, a, a lot of them just want to jump in and start making something that, uh, that they know is, is really fun and exciting and engaging and they, they want people to, to play it and go, wow, how'd you do that? And it, it's, it's almost hard to say, okay, well, settle down. Let's, let's take baby steps. You know, he can't just jump in and make something uh, AAA, you know, uh, that we, we've got to learn how to make the, uh, the basics. Um, like, uh, like Timothy and, uh, and Walt were talking about earlier, chess, right? You got to learn how those basic fundamentals work and the core mechanics and how to implement them into the game. So seeing them come in and, you, when you start breaking it down into that that core mechanic level, and uh, they start talking about things, and they they start to relate that. Oh, great! That's that's kind of like how that works. And when you see that aha moment in them, and they start to understand why Fortnite works the way it does, or why Overwatch works the way it does, or or any of the other uh, games that they happen to be playing at that moment. Um, and then they start to understand, oh, that, that's what that is. Okay, cool. Now, how can I implement that into something that I want to make? And uh, they get into that. And that, that's, that's a really big uh, thing that they find is exciting and they want to learn more about it. And uh, they, they want to understand how do they make mods? How can they create their own mods to put into games that already exist? Uh, and th that was kind of jumping a little bit back to the way technology and, and uh, the industry has changed and evolved. Back when uh, games were, were starting off, um, you know, you have like E.T., right? The, the infamous horrible game. Um, they, they were forced to make the game and finish the game within a deadline. You build the game, you put it out, there's the game, right? E.T. didn't have a chance to get fixed. Well, what if uh, that same, uh, you know, workflow was existent today? Fallout 76 is a horrible disaster, right? Within the first week, they had to put out over 100 gigs of patches, 100 gigs of patches to fix that. That's, that's insane. If you ask me, that's a bigger failure than E.T. So um, why is that game still around? Well, it's because they can put out uh, more things. And uh, like with mods, you can add stuff to a game now. It doesn't have to be all done at the same time. You can put out a base game and then little by little put out more stuff, which is a huge deal with DLC. Companies love putting that out. They got a, a AAA full price game, but then, hey, if you want to get the entire experience, you got to spend another $10, $15, $40 uh, to get this additional content. Um, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's uh, extra skins. Uh, but, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah. And it's interesting how, so yeah, that's huge. I didn't think about it until you said it, that we now have the ability to, to patch and fix games so they can be shipped um, and still be completed as you install it. And it's interesting because going back to the, to the old arcades is you didn't have that. You had kill screens, which was you get to the end of that puppy and it's just going to die on you. You can't just fix it and keep going at it. So that's really interesting to me. Um, so moving forward, uh, so we have we have a wide range of listeners. Uh, most of our listeners are in career technical education, across, usually most of them across the state of California. We do get some up in Ireland somehow. I don't know how, but they're listening up there. Um, in your guys' opinion, what can CT educators do to help prepare their students for a career that's in um, arts and entertainment industry? And what I mean by that is not just game production, but you all have worked with graphic designers, animators, um, just a wide variety of people who work in the arts and entertainment industry. So again, how would you tell your, the teachers, what can they do to prepare those students for a, a career in this industry? 
if I may start here, um, as both a you know industry professional and a former teacher, uh, I think one of the best things you can teach your student really across any discipline is teach them how to fail successfully, right? You know, in my experience as a game designer specifically here, right? How many games get pitched that never you make it to market, right? How many games, like Alexander said, Fallout 76 looks great on paper, flops when it released because, you know, a dozen or so reasons, right? So it's students in general have to learn how to fail and take away what they can from that failure, right? I think it was, uh, you know, Bill Gates or uh, I paraphrase again, I think but Bill Gates said like, you learn more from your failures than you'll ever learn from your successes, right? So the ability to analyze what you've done wrong and make changes that positively affect the next outcome is one of the best things you can teach anybody. Mm -hmm. we, we recently had a guy named Brian, Brian Cronin over on our podcast and he was talking about how he had a failed Kickstarter and that like that was successful in that his thing he was trying to inform was, should I move forward on this? And the answer was no, time well spent, time to try the next thing. And what a great attitude that is for like in game space, we're used to this idea of like six out of seven things aren't worth doing. How do you tell? You start trying it. And, uh, but yeah, so for me, it's, I think kind of goes back to your point, Christopher, about like, okay, we've all worked with different kinds of people in adjacent fields. And for me, that's where like, for anyone to do anything significant in games, you have to learn to deal with people who aren't like you. People who have different goals, different values, different backgrounds, different strengths, different objectives they want out of it. The artists and the musicians and your programmers and your writers and your producers are all going to always be tugging at each other being like, no, color does matter. No level design is going to get in the way of your architecture of your engine. And you've got to find ways to make those compromises. And that only comes from experience of not being overly siloed in our comp site people only talk to comp site people. Our artists only work with artists. Our writers only talk to writers. Crossing those boundaries where bigger, cooler, better things happen that satisfy more mainstream tastes of not having these massive glaring gaps and oversight of, you know, we use red, green, and blue because those are colors, uh, which turns out to not usually hold it, you know, work anymore. Mm -hmm. One of the lessons I used to teach uh, when I was teaching at the high schools was we do a, a unit on you know applying for jobs. So I would the students would have to look for new jobs and, and you know apply for them in theory, right? And I'd always make up a point to see look at the top, I would say top three, maybe top five the most skills required for any job, programming artist, designer, producer, whatever. One of the things that's always in the top five is the ability to communicate well. Communication mm -hmm. skills are essential. Like Chris said, if you can't if you can't get your vision to the programmer, then he can't program it. You know, if the programmer can't, can't get the art right, then the artist can't do her thing, right? So you have to be able to talk to each other, not only to get your point across, but to be able to listen better, right? Again, it's a back and forth. It's not a one-way flow. So teaching communication skills is also highly effective, also very, very important. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd also say the, the fail thing that uh, Timothy was saying, I, I, I do the same thing. Fail, fail often. It, it's from our failures where we learn the most. When you're just doing something and you're just, kicking it you're killing it uh, again and again and again um yeah okay great you're doing that but are you really gaining any additional progress doing that not really you're just doing it because you're an expert at it now uh but no one got to that level without failing a tremendous amount of times first so be willing to to fail and do it a lot and find out what happened why did that not work um and then also is to um Oh, what was I thinking? Oh, uh, never, never settle. Uh, never uh, think that this is the best that I can do. This is the most that I will know. Always be learning. Always be trying something new. The moment you settle and think I'm the best there is, that's when you fail. Because there's always someone else out there who's better than you. So never think that you are the best. Uh, always keep going. Always keep learning. Always be ready to um, you know, make a make that jump or leap and not know where you are. If you're staying in that comfort zone, you're not learning, and that's the only way to keep going, keep progressing, keep on moving. Yeah, and make, can I interject something here? Absolutely. So, uh, so also, uh, the students who are coming up through the ranks, they can propel themselves forward, maybe even faster maybe even farther and higher, just by being open to miracles. So I have, I think it's either between six and eight people who were little kids who became superstars for Twin Galaxies like 35 years ago. 
And because of their association with Twin Galaxies and their, and their, and their expertise in game playing, they actually got hired by Atari and Konami and Capcom and uh, Midway Games. And they actually became game people who were in the game industry, either designing games or, or being the project directors. I guess they call them producers. I guess that's what they call them in the industry. They became producers over many, many important games. And I know one was with Sony, one was with Konami, one was with Atari, one with the, and I think three of those people or four of those people already are in the International Video Game Hall of Fame, which operates out of Ottumwa, Iowa, which is considered by many people the video game capital of the world. The, the mayor, 30, almost 40 years ago, proclaimed the city the video game capital of the world. So Atari and the governor of Iowa went there and also proclaimed it the video game capital of the world. But essentially, uh, uh, they didn't have any training for it. Their only background was that they loved games and they happened to be in the right place at the right time. So be open for miracles. Be, be expecting of things that will happen that you couldn't foresee, you couldn't foreshadow. And so uh, essentially, uh, it's possible to go to, uh, like when I started Twin Galaxies, I was not a part of the video game industry. I just opened up an arcade. And suddenly overnight, because Twin Galaxy became the scorekeeper for the whole world, in a sense, uh, uh, Twin Galaxy's prestige went to the front of the line. And we became uh, important figures in the video game industry. And we didn't have any training. We didn't have any education. I didn't have a degree for it. I had no background. I didn't know any programming. I didn't know anything about the gaming industry, except that we happened to do something that was helpful, need, helpful was needed, and was a service. So as you begin to design your career, Think in terms of how you can serve other people also, because you'll find out there can always be an immense surprise just around the corner that you weren't expecting, but it happens because the world needs you. That's awesome. That is a great point. Um, so, so my next question for you guys is what, again, we're talking to, talking to a student who's at home right now, um, somebody who, who probably wants to be in some sort of entertainment industry um, what do you think they can do to start preparing for a career, whether it be their, their soft skills, such as their resume writing, your applications and whatnot, or their technical skills? What advice would you give to somebody, um, who, a teenager who is wanting to, again, get into a, the industry? What, what can they do at start getting ready now at home? Start building that portfolio. Uh, start, uh, continue learning, continue uh, moving forward, building that portfolio, constantly improving it. And, uh, and be willing to find critique anywhere and everywhere and apply it and just keep moving forward. Keep, uh, keep building. Yeah, kind of building off of that, I think, uh, just like Alex is saying, don't be afraid to just start making something, um, create something. You know, we kind of talked about how the industry's changed over the years, and I think accessibility is a big thing that we touched on today, which is like these tools that, uh, are now free basically to anyone like unity and unreal and those types of game engines um, You can just go on and learn and I know especially right now during this pandemic time there are a bunch of free resources online to to learn things and So more than doing you can't just talk about it, you got to be about it So uh, my advice would be just to make sure that you're actually, you know, put your put your skills to practice and, and create something my, my main two things, and they sound contradictory, but I promise they're not. Uh, one is, is sort of a sampler platter approach of early on before you really zero in on, okay, I'm a 3D modeler or programming is my hat or whatever. Do a bit of dabbling in some different things. Feel out, try on some shoes and see which ones you're comfortable in. Uh, there's, there's so many benefits to either, you know, kind of getting on the track of like, actually some of these come a little more naturally to me. I think the same way about which sport someone should play. You go to some different tryouts, you try some different things, you figure out, okay, I happen to move in a way that's right for football or right for wrestling or right for basketball. And I can build on that easier than if I'm fighting upstream on like, I'm just not shaped for soccer, whatever that means. That's just not who I am. And it's hard to tell until we try it because these are so vastly different ways of thinking and process and iteration and so on. If you're doing music, if you're doing writing, if you're doing mar models or whatever. And also I just think it helps us make it better communicators with other people. I feel like how school forces us to do all these different subjects. So even if I'm not a mathematician or historian, I appreciate what those people are going through and respect the difficulty of that work and makes me a better communicator with them than if I treat them like a black box of like, ah, oh, that work's getting done. It'd be, if I could do it if I wanted to, I've tried it and been like, no, that's hard. I respect your modeling. 
Uh, the other side of that, though, is to finish things. And this is what, of course, will set you apart from anybody else out there who is stopping a dabbling. And so the reason why they are contradictory is because they don't have to be enormous things. It's better to have some small things that are wrapped up, put a bow on it, and it's got instructions on it so a stranger can play it. Someone can look at it. It's publicly on the internet on itch or otherwise. It's out there. I'm not saying you have to sell a product on the App Store or sell it on Steam. But like I say, upload it to itch.io.com or some similar free web portal. Your game exists. Wrap it up. Move on from it. Do the next thing. And a, a history of finishing stuff will look way better for somebody than I've got a garage full of scrap but nothing to show for it. Uh, good to dabble to find your place, but then make sure you're actually doing stuff with it. That's good. I like that. This may sound uh, a little bit harsh possibly, but for any of us who have been to, you know, gaming conventions or any kind of conventions in general, um, hygiene. I know it sounds like <laughs> I'm dead serious. Uh, as someone who's worked in the industry and in the creative industry, like there are times when you're up close to a lot of people and you're, you know, you're working in small quarters. Um, uh, being able to have proper hygiene is super important. I've heard of people not getting jobs because of it. Like during an interview, they were just offensive to the, to the, uh, to the nose, so to speak. So uh, yeah, I know it sounds silly, but hygiene, learn it, super important. Good, very cool. So, so here's so my last question. Um, is there any final advice you would give to like a 12 to 20 year old student who is, who's dreaming of being in the video game industry? Well, kind of to uh, top of what Chris was saying earlier, don't dream, do, make something, right? You know, you got to find out early what you're good at, what you like, and enjoy that, right? If you want to do this for a living, you're going to be doing it every day for the rest of your life, more or less, right? So making, you know, I can only test making video games because it's all the industry I've worked in, but making games is a lot of fun, but it's also the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my entire life. So if I don't love it, why am I doing it, right? So you have to love it and you have to, you have to start making stuff. Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll throw in there as well the, uh, trying not to be too redundant, but I already mentioned, but basically to, uh, I, I think one of the things that's real important too starting out, and I, I do the same thing I'm meeting with new private training clients or people trying to join home team game dev or whatever, and that's figuring out what do you actually want out of this? Because there's very different forms of success, and it doesn't mean we're going to get the one we're shooting for, but it, it's different things to, it's like I mentioned with Indicate and Arts Festival, games that get awards and, and highlights and, and critical responses there aren't necessarily the ones that are selling super well. There's some Venn diagram overlap, but that's not a one-to-one. -one. Some games are selling like hotcakes and are not going to win any recognition anywhere because it's just not the kind of thing it is. It's not innovative. It's super polished. And for the same thing too, if somebody's career in life is, like I said, or in my own path, I wasn't happy at an enormous company. I knew people who were perfectly happy there. They want to go to work, solve exactly the problem someone put on their desk, go home and sleep happy. Was it the wrong problem to solve? I don't know. That's someone else's job. Uh, I like the small company environment, but it's a very different skill set to train yourself up for to be I'm on a strike force of four or five of us. We're out there hustling, balancing contract work, trying to keep our lights on while we're trying to get our own IP out in one or two days a week. It's a very different thing than I need to slide into engineering role two at this level, at this company. There's a very specific background they want to train you for for interviews so that that's how those structures work. And there's no disrespect about any of those fits, but it's a different kind of skill set. And I think sometimes people will take their way down one track or the other pretty far before they realize like, oh shoot, I'm very much a round, round peg for a square hole for what this thing as I kind of thought I was gearing up to do. So it's, it's worth kind of looking ahead to finding some examples of who, whose path am I trying to follow? What got them there? How'd they do that? Uh, what are the risks involved and how do I mitigate those? But it, there's so many different ways into it. It's not a one size fits all. It's not a universal road of it's all forward progress down the same destination. There's very different things to us. I knew somebody's criteria was like, I just want, they wanted fan art to be made of their thing. They didn't care if it was freeware. They didn't care if it wasn't making sales or getting critical rewards or whatever. They wanted fan art made of their thing. And they got that success as a game developer. Nice. Um, I'll jump in and say that kind of uh, like what Tim and, and Chris have already been saying is that you definitely need to try and uh, try different things because going into like from my um, experience, going into animation and, and visual effects, a lot of people would think, Oh, I want to do animation. I want to make something like that, but they they don't fully understand the all the different jobs, all the different steps uh, for animation. So they want to do animation. Really, they want to make the the thing be able to move. They want to rig. They want to be a technical director, uh, or they want to make it look beautiful. They want to do the texturing and the lighting, um, or they they want to be a digital actor. 
and breathe life into the character. So there's so many different um, elements in the job. So the only way you're going to learn that is jump in and start creating, start seeing all those different paths. Um, like Chris said, uh, dabbling, right? Be kind of a, a generalist and learn all the little steps and understand, okay, this, this is cool. It's not my forte. I'm not super good at it. So mad respect to those who can do it. And I'm going to do something else. Uh, this is the part that I'm actually really good at. And who knows, maybe you um, end up finding out that you're much better at writing code than you are putting, uh, you know, moving the joints and the figures of a rig and doing that. You, you started out thinking, oh, I want to be an animator. I want to animate the characters. But no, you, you actually are much better suited for doing the coding of, of that automatic stuff or doing procedural work. Um, and so, so the only way you're going to figure that stuff out is, is jump in and try it. Uh, try, try, and try again. If I can sneak in, there's because there's that overlap. I've into it. I meet people who are like, oh, I really love coding, but I also really like art stuff. I'm like, technical artist is a job. People need shaders programmed, and you need a visual eye and comfort writing programming. That's a whole thing. Look for those combo. I was a technical game designer because I like doing game design and programming. Technical game design is a job too. There's overlaps for these things. Yeah. Uh, my, my only final thought on this is that uh, uh, there's quite a common expression follow your bliss. Uh, if you go to over to the light switch and just flick the, the light switch up, the only way that the light goes on is if that you bother to put the light bulb up in the light bulb picture. Okay, my my point of, my point of this analogy is that you love you love the idea of being involved in the video game industry, but you've got to go out and get the training. If it's not through normal schools and educators like that, it's at least being mentored by someone or being a uh, what word is escaping right now. Anyway, working under someone. So you'd have to be uh, working under someone just so that you'll have the skill set so that when the opportunity comes and, the, and someone's switching the light switch up, that there will be a light bulb in place that can go on and light the room up. But as you begin to learn more and more different areas of the gaming field, because like, a, like you said, if there are so many of those gaming fields that overlapped and they're all, uh, they're all you know, kind of subordinate to each other in a sense, you will find that you'll be better at something than you, are, than you are at something else. And you'll find that if there's more joy and happiness, that's where they get the expression, follow your bliss. Whatever causes you the most happiness will be the thing that we're able to focus on the most and understand the deepest because you'll never give up because it's so much fun and enjoyable to do this. Like I've done all the stuff I've done because it was so much fun, I couldn't have done anything else. So if you follow your bliss, follow your happiness, you'll find that it'll open up usually the right doors for you that will lead to some sort of success. Yeah, just kind of to touch on uh, what Walt was saying about finding maybe a mentor if it's not through school. I think surrounding yourself, uh, like immersing yourself in a community of people who are passionate about the same thing you are is very important. So uh, a lot of people do get that through school, um, but there's other, there's other ways to find that. You know, you can find it online uh, through things like Facebook and Twitter and social media, these, all these platforms that allow us to connect. So I would say try to find uh, a group of people who have the same passions as you and learn with them and learn from them and share information with each other. And that couldn't have been a more beautiful segue into our last concluding question, which is um, CT Teach is primarily, it's a statewide program that focuses on mentoring other CT teachers across the state. So every episode I ask my panelists, like who is somebody who is mentored you or inspired you both per, either per, personally or professionally. I um, mean, we'll just kind of go around the horn of how we introduced each other. I um, mean, just tell me like, who is, who is your mentor shout out? Who do you want to say thank you to for, for inspiring you in where you are today? All right. So, um, I, I'm going to butcher her name. I know that, uh, it, Virgin Dillian Angelone, uh, I, I, I can never ever say her last name. Uh, but she was one of my teachers uh, when I was studying character animation. Um, she's worked at Pixar and ILM. And if you've ever seen Dancing Yoda, that was her. Um, and she did the Hulk and all sorts of other characters, iconic characters that I have always wanted to animate. And um, just she made learning so much fun and did such a great job of breaking down what you've done uh, pointing out what is fantastic about it, why 
it work? And at the same time, what uh, can be, you know, polished? What can still use uh, some more attention? Uh, she did such a good job of breaking that down for you on a personal level. And the way that she approached her teaching, the way that she approached animation, her workflow, because she would get up and show us um, what, what she did and how she did things. Uh, it was just, it, that stuck with me. And I um, utilize a lot of her methods in my teaching in the classroom um, and online when I'm it, it sharing my, my passion for, for what I do and trying to get others to, to see it in the same light. I, I go back to a lot of the stuff that she did for me and I'll, I'll be playing it in my head as I'm going through it and, uh, and then hoping that I'm not uh, doing any of it wrong. But yeah, Virginia, if you're out there somewhere, uh, God bless you. Love you. Awesome. Well, for me, uh, my mentorship award would have to go to Mr. Christopher McClung right here. Okay. Uh, I don't think we talked about this last time I was on the podcast, but I mentioned earlier how I didn't know I wanted to teach till after I got out of high school. And uh, that pretty much came from being in his class. So I actually went through uh, the class that I teach now myself when I was in high school. And so just the way that you taught the class and uh, the experiences that I had in there with working with different people on the projects, uh, it just sort of led me down this path. And of course, um, now working with you and having you sort of mentor all the other new teachers has been just an awesome experience. So thank you. There's no crying aloud on this podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for mine, uh, I, I, this guy, I probably only touched base with him maybe five or six years now. Uh, but Kurt Barrington, he's, uh, when I mentioned PopCap San Francisco earlier, he was the co-founder of that company, uh, along with Matil Pignol. Before that, when he was a PhD student, I was a freshman in college, he had started a game club. And that game club at Carnegie Mellon is the one I built our processes into. That same pattern uh, was helpful in my early career and a bunch of other folks starting out. When I went to grad school at Georgia Tech, I spun up that same pattern. That helped a bunch of people at Georgia Tech. When I left grad, uh, grad school, my business now, Home Team Game Dev, is built partly around that model, plus mentorship and other kind of services and materials and learning support. But it's still built on this idea of like the collaborative learning approach to doing things was something that would not have happened in my life if it weren't for him, as well as just as a role model of the fact he was an entrepreneur, uh, made it seem very accessible, made it just seem like here's a thing people do and I didn't really have any role models in my life before that of seeing somebody start a business. To me, before that, work just looked like, okay, well, what are the existing brands that go out and work for? What are the existing businesses that go out and connect to? And I think it was really important that it was during time of kind of indie development, early publishing world for mobile and so on, that I saw someone doing that to realize like, human beings do this. These, these companies come out of people. Uh, somewhere, somehow, there's some other way to do stuff and string it together and connect customers to products and services and I think seeing that was really helpful and important for me in terms of finding my place and approach to things as something I could do independently. Take us in a slightly different direction here. Um, I would say the person who has inspired me the most throughout my career as uh, a game designer has to be the original OG game designer, Shigeru Miyamoto. Um, I mean, this the insanity that this man com that comes out of this man's head, you know, and he, it, and it's time after time. It's like, it's hit after hit. It's like, how does somebody be that creative and that spot on that many times in a row. Uh, so, I mean, every time I get stuck, I, you know, I try to think, well, what would, what would he do? <laughs> like, how would he solve this problem, you know? So, I never, unfortunately, I've never met the man personally, and I, I hope to someday. Um, but, yeah, he's definitely the person who has inspired me the most because he's just so darn creative. And then how about you, Walt? Who's your, who gets your mentor inspirational accolades? Okay. I'm a symmetry breaker. So this is, might be a little bit of a surprise, but who, where do I get all my inspiration whenever I have inspiration? Where do I get my insight? What, what is it that helps me get through things and helps me figure out things and help me unfold things or create things, whatever? So it's not a person. You might have heard this in maybe other interviews if you've ever heard of me interviews, but believe it or not, every single day I sit down 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, and I practice transcendental meditation. And I don't know if you guys know about it, it's in the news almost every single day now, because doctors and scientists and all sorts of people are talking about that just by sitting down and doing 20 minutes of TM, as they call it, it changes the way your nerves work. And when it changes the way your nerves work and the body functions, it causes your head to become clearer, your mind to be you you're, you're become more relaxed, you become happier, you become clearer, and all those almost, all, all those creative 
things that are down inside you. It's like the channel opens up, almost like a garden hose that has a nozzle. You can open the nozzle all the way up. All that creativity that's there that, you, that, that slips by you so many times, you're able to bring that in and bring it to life and own it by just sitting down and changing the way your nervous system works. They've done tons and tons of research on your EEG in your brain and stuff like that. And it turns out that your brain begins to operate in a special new way just from sitting down and meditating twice a day, the TM1. There's a lot of things out there called meditation, but it's specifically the TM1 that I do. And that there inspires me, lifts me up, uh, recharges my battery at the end of the day so then I have time and energy and clarity to do things at night. So it's pretty much a, to me, it's like a miracle. So that is, to me, is the most valuable adjunct to my whole life from improving my digestion and improving my sleep to also opening up that channel to that creative resource that we all know is inside there, but quite often can be difficult to grab onto and pull the stuff out. So that to me is my mentor, just that regular practice every day, doing it 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening. And you'll see me talk about this elsewhere too in other interviews if you ever see them. So anyway, that there's the story. Very cool. So I'm going to give um, a last concluding spiel. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining the CT Teach podcast. We hope you've enjoyed your time with us as much as we have with you. We also invite you to follow us on Twitter at CT underscore teach and subscribe to our YouTube channel and multiple podcast um, stations, including Spotify and iTunes at CT Teach. And as every month we close with an inspirational quote, and I thought this one would be perfect, um, which is, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this from The Legend of Zelda. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Make video games. <laughs>